So we've got discount rates nailed down, we have the cash flows. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because so far we've been on familiar ground. We've been looking at financial statements and actual prices from the past to back up our estimates. Now I ask you the key question. How quickly will this company grow in the future? The first reaction that most people have is who knows? But in valuation, you have no choice. You have to estimate growth for the future. And you have three choices. You can look at the past, historical growth. You can outsource it. You can ask other people, analysts and management, what they think the growth will be. Or you can try to estimate growth yourself. Based on what? Based on what the company does, how much it reinvests, and how well it reinvests. By the end of this session, I hope to convince you that the third approach is the one that is most consistent with intrinsic valuation. In the last few sessions, we've talked about the first two inputs into valuation, cash flows and discount rates. Today, we're going to talk about the number where the rubber meets the road, where most people start to get uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you about growth. And the reason people become uncomfortable is growth is in the future. In a sense, you're trying to play God, trying to estimate numbers. So let me lay out the three basic ways in which you can estimate growth. One is you can look backwards. You can look at the past. How quickly has this company grown in the last three years, the last five years, the last 10 years? That's historical growth. The second is you can outsource it. You can ask somebody else. In particular, many analysts of value companies ask the managers of the companies what the growth is going to be in the future. After all, they should know their companies better than you and I do, right? Or they look at analysts, other people who look at the company, value the company, and look at their growth rates. And it's easier and easier to get those estimates now for many companies. But I'm going to argue for a third way of estimating growth. I'm going to make a basic thesis. Growth has to be earned. You and I don't have the power to go around endowing companies with high growth or taking away growth from other companies. So let's start with historical growth and why I'm skeptical about whether it's going to give you a sense of future growth. When you talk about historical growth, you think of a number. It should be the same number for every person looking at the company, right? Not true. It depends first on the measure that you're looking at. Whether you're looking at growth in revenues, growth in operating income, growth in net income, growth in earnings per share, you can get very different numbers. Second, it depends on the time period you look at the company. Growth rates over the last three years can be very different than over the last five or the last 10. In particular, if you pick a particularly bad year as your base year, so five years ago was a really terrible year, you're going to get a much higher growth rate. And third, and this again is going to sound like inside statistics, but hang in there, the growth can be very different depending on where it, whether it's an arithmetic average or a geometric average. Geometric averages allow for compounding. They're much more realistic estimates of growth, but they can be either. That's why you can look for the same company on different data services and end up with very different numbers as the historical growth rate. There are a couple of general propositions about growth I want to emphasize. One is growth becomes meaningless when your company's earnings go from a negative number to a positive number. So if your earnings last year were minus 100 and this year it's plus 100, I can't give you a growth rate. I can tell you that year was a good year, but I can't tell you what the growth rate is. Second, Scaling up is hard to do. As companies get bigger, it's more and more difficult to maintain those really high growth rates. Something to keep in mind as you start to do valuation. As a general rule, I look at historical growth rates for companies I value, but I'm not bound by them. In fact, history suggests that a lot of growth rates are not sustainable. Companies that have maintained high growth in the past don't necessarily maintain them in the future. Let's look at the outside estimates for growth, managers and analysts. As I said, managers do know more about the company than you and I do, but they have two fatal flaws. One is they cannot be objective. What manager is going to tell you that he's a rotten manager and he's going to run the company into the ground? Management growth rates, therefore, might not be realistic because managers can't be biased about themselves or unbiased about themselves. They're definitely biased about themselves. Analyst growth rates are bad for a different reason. Analysts are focused on earnings per share. They're focused on the short term, and they often can't look past the short term. So if you look at analyst growth rates, they historically have not been very good predictors of long-term growth. So I've ruled out historical growth. I don't trust analyst estimates of growth. Where are you going to go for growth? Look at the company itself. For a company to grow over time, it's got to reinvest a significant portion of its earnings back into the business, and it's got to reinvest it well. In other words, to estimate the growth for a company, I've got to look at how much it reinvests and how well it reinvests. And effectively, if you think about fundamental or intrinsic growth, it can come from one of two places. It can, it can come from adding to your asset base, making new investments and earning a return on those new investments, 
or it can come from efficiency. Let me take the first of those. When you add to your investment base, you can grow. And in fact, to see how much you can grow, I'm going to try to answer those two questions. How much are you reinvesting? How well are you reinvesting? I'm going to try to scale both. Again, to get away from abstractions, let me look at estimating what I call fundamental sustainable or intrinsic growth. They're all used interchangeably in equity earnings and operating earnings. So if you came to me with a company with equity earnings and said, what's the growth rate in the equity earnings in this company going to be in the long term? I'm going to look at the portion of equity earnings, net income, that gets reinvested back in the company. The simplest proxy for that is called the retention ratio. What is the retention ratio? It's whatever you don't pay out. So if you pay out 40% of your earnings as dividends, you've got a 60% retention ratio. And the measure of how well you reinvest, I'm going to capture with your return on equity. So when you invest that equity in a project, what kind of return are you getting? So as an example, again, if your return on equity is 20%, with that retention ratio of 60%, your expected growth in equity earnings is going to be 60% times 20%, which is 12%. When I'm looking at operating income, I'm going to vary those measures slightly. Instead of looking at the percentage of net income that I reinvest, I'm going to look at the percentage of after-tax operating income that I put back into the business in net capex and change in working capital. You remember we talked about those in the context of cash flows. Net capex here includes acquisitions. It includes R&D. Looking at that percentage tells me how much of the after-tax operating income goes back into the business. So let's say it's 70%. For every $100 in after-tax operating income, $70 goes back into net capex and change in working capital. To see how well you reinvest, I'm going to look at the return on capital. 